Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. It's Mr. Vallejo, and welcome to science class today. Today, I'll be taking a look at the chemistry of seawater with you. So let's go ahead and share the screen, and we'll go to today's PowerPoint. And there we are. So today, we're taking a look at the chemistry of seawater. All right. Now, you probably know the seawater tastes a little salty, and that is because it is made up of many different ions, but primarily sodium and chloride. And when you stick sodium and chloride together, you get sodium chloride, which is table salt. And that's why seawater tastes a little salty. In fact, about, of all the ions, uh, minerals that are in seawater, about 85% of those are sodium and chloride. Now, the concentration of, of that um, salt, uh, the concentration of all the different solutes, of all the different minerals that are dissolved, is actually um, not, not uh, given as a percentage, but uh, it's actually not parts per hundred, but parts per thousand. So this looks similar to the percentage symbol, but right here you have two zeros. And so that's how we measure salinity. Usually we say they're uh, 35 uh, parts per thousand or PPT. So um, if you see PPT or if you see the symbol right here, we're talking about parts per thousand. And again, it's about 35 uh, parts per thousand on the average for, for ocean water. And if you take a look at this diagram here, it tells you that if you add these two numbers together, look, that's 19 and 10, uh, what you get is what, 29, but this is one. So that is uh, 11 and 19, that's 30. Okay, so 30 parts per, per thousand uh, are uh, from sodium and chloride. And you can see here's a list of the rest of the, uh, the different minerals, the different chemicals that are also found in seawater at much, much less lower quantities at a much lower concentration. So if you add these up right here, it says percentage of total salinity. This is how you get the 85% number there uh, for sodium and chloride. All right, um, so 35 uh, parts per thousand, but that, that's the average. It doesn't, it's not necessarily 35 parts per, per thousand everywhere. Uh, the salinity in different places have different, different salinities. Um, where it says here, ocean water near a location where a river meets the sea can be much less because it, this is a, a photo of the Mississippi River and there is the Mississippi River and, and this is uh, Louisiana right here. And the Delta region of Louisiana um, is filled with different uh, different locations here, different swamps and lakes and such, and those have a much lower salinity. Um, even a, a freshwater tank uh, has a, a freshwater lake has a uh, some some salt in it. In fact, when you are uh, when you have an aquarium at your house and you're uh, and you're trying to uh, keep it more lifelike. What you do is you have to actually add salt back into your aquarium water, but not, not as much as 35 parts per thousand, but uh, over here, river meeting the sea, 15 to 25, so much, uh, much lower salinity factor for, uh, for this water here. These are, this is also a very important place for for organisms to reproduce, it's called an estuary region. And, uh, and that's where the salt water and the fresh water mix, the fresh water from the rivers, the salt water from the ocean mix up. So you get a, a lower salinity and, and many different organisms actually use these types of locations as their breeding ground. Um, other areas, instead of having a lower uh, salinity can have a higher salinity and this is a example of a, a lake um, in Louisiana. This is Lake Charles, and Lake Charles has a, uh, a higher uh, salinity factor because the water is evaporating and no rivers are, are bringing in 
uh, fresh water. So we have the water evaporating. So I just get salt here and salt here. We call that brackish water. Water is also relatively transparent. And because it's transparent, that, that sunlight can pass through a good section of the water. <coughs> However, it does dissipate and it doesn't go down deep to the bottom of the ocean or anything. The bottom of the ocean is actually quite dark and the uh, sunlight can only uh, go down in about <coughs> 60 feet or so, about 10 meters. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, most of the organisms live on the top, on the surface of the ocean. It says here, this means that sun, sunlight shining on the surface can penetrate the surface. <coughs> but again, not, not to a great degree. So most of the organisms live on the top. The algae uh, that uh, provide the oxygen for, for the world, they're called uh, the uh, phytoplankton. Phytoplankton uh, uh, need light, and so uh, they need to. Uh, most of them are found in the top regions of the of the surface of the surface water. Okay, uh, solutes stuff dissolved in the water can also have an effect on on how deep the water goes. Excuse me, or how how deep the light goes, how how far the light can penetrate. So. Obviously, you have uh, a cloudy water with a lot of dissolved uh, minerals. You're going to have light not go through as deep. <coughs> Where those minerals come from? Those minerals come from, from the continents. If you take a look at this picture here, this is a really large rock. Well, how is it that we can break this really large rock? Well, this rock and the breakdown of the rock actually is called weathering. So. The, this, uh, this, the weathering uh, major factor is this large crack here. You can see in this picture right here, water goes in the cracks. And then in areas where things freeze, well, this water is going to expand. And it says down here in small print, it expands about 9% in volume. So the water goes in, but at night it freezes and it expands and it, and it pushes the, the surfaces of, or, or the pieces of rock away from each other and does this over and over every, every day. Uh, and so this is going to eventually, uh, this freezing and then thawing out and freezing and thawing out that cycles can break down even the largest rocks as you can see right here. So um, you can add solutes to the water, but you've also uh, have seawater that where you add, add water to the seawater to to lower the salinity, it says here water comes from rivers and from rain, from precipitation, and to a much lesser extent, I should have wrote, from, from melting of the polar ice caps. Now, about 30, 40 years ago, they would say, hey, um, I remember uh, when I first started teaching in the, in the 1980s, they said that uh, by the year 2000, the polar ice caps will melt so much that the, the levels of the ocean will rise up 65 feet. Well, if that happened, there would be many places in the world that uh, have, would have their have cities uh, start to go underwater, kind of like this stuff right here. This is uh, Louisiana after a, a torrential uh, rainstorm right there. And, uh, and so, uh, you can add water, you can add sol solutes, you can take away water, take away solutes. And so these different, different uh, factors can result in varying salinity of uh, ocean water, of seawater, and of uh, water in freshwater lakes. Not only are there minerals in water, but there are also gases. The gases uh, dissolve from the atmosphere into the ocean at the interface, which is in between the, the ocean and the, um, and the atmosphere. So those, those gases will dissolve in. Here's a list of gases. It's oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen. These will go into the ocean water from the atmosphere, but also going back up. Um, sometimes 
Well, the, the chemical, the reverse reaction also happens. Um, and it says here, gases from the atmosphere dissolve at the sea surface and occasionally the reverse happens. And actually it's more like, it does happen all the time. It's just that usually the net movement is from, from the atmosphere to the, uh, to the ocean. And so in the ocean, you have dissolved carbon dioxide, let's say. Um, in the ocean, you have dissolved oxygen. There has to be enough dissolved oxygen so the fish have, have something to breathe in the water. Um, the carbon dioxide is kind of interesting because you do have a, a certain amount of carbon dioxide that's dissolved into the, into the ocean water. But as we, uh, you know, from uh, the past 200 years or so, we've uh, had the industrialization of, of, uh, of first world countries and, and combustion of, of uh, oils and such. And that released carbon dioxide into the into the atmosphere. So there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the last 200, 300 years. That means there's going to be more that dissolves into the into the ocean. So the oceans uh, have more carbon carbon dioxide, but that carbon dioxide reacts with the with the ocean water and forms acids. And so this is why you get the problem where that is known as the ocean acidification because the ocean is becoming more acidic because the car because there's more carbon dioxide in the air and that means there's more carbon dioxide that's dissolving into the ocean so um, ocean acidification uh, is a problem as the as the ocean becomes more acidic and more and more living things um, are not adapted to live in that more acidic that harsher environment so could be a problem. Also, uh, although most people, most scientists say that the dinosaurs became extinct because the meteors would come down um, and, and 65 million years ago, there were meteors or giant meteors or something. And, and then the, they would, they, they crashed down onto the earth and and then the atmosphere was filled with, with soot and dirt and pollution, and that blocked the rays of the sun. And so the plants died because they didn't get enough sunlight, and then the animals died because they didn't have enough to eat. Well, that's generally the, the theory that you hear. But there are some scientists that think that back in the day, 65 million years ago, there was also an increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this increase in carbon dioxide uh, uh, happened, and, and uh, it wasn't just in the atmosphere, but there's an increase of carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean. But it could be that this increase in carbon dioxide was not because of, of pollution from a meteor or a, a meteor storm or a giant giant meteor hit the earth, but it could be that uh, what happens is that, well, you have this carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the water, and we'll see it in a little bit, maybe that carbon dioxide from the ocean just came up all of a sudden, now all of a sudden uh, geologically, maybe in a period of a thousand years or so, there was a great increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In essence, we can say that the ocean burped. Maybe the ocean burped and released a bunch of carbon dioxide, and that's what killed off all the plants and then animals 65 million years ago in one of the great extinctions. So um, that's an interesting theory. And then this bullet points that many organisms in the ocean utilize oxygen, and release carbon dioxide. So, um, and, and that's true for land animals and plants also. Um, you probably are familiar with the, the idea that animals use oxygen through respiration and then breathe out carbon dioxide and the plants take that carbon dioxide and use it for photosynthesis and we have that cycle. 
but it's more proper to say that, okay, so a plant can make its own food, but if a plant's making its own food, it's going to use that food too. And so when a plant uses its food, it also goes through respiration. So a plant also needs oxygen in order to um, go ahead and, and go on with its life uh, activities, with its metabolism. So plants don't just use carbon dioxide in photosynthesis. Plants use, photo, uh, use oxygen also, and they use that oxygen uh, to uh, just to live. So, um, so that's something we forget. <clears throat> All righty, this slide says conditions vary and, and they, they do. We make some generalizations, but we have uh, the ocean floor, the water column, the surface of the ocean. There are different zones that we're gonna cover and those different zones can be different in the amount of gases that they have. They're gonna be uh, described by the, the average temperature and what the trend is of the temperature as you go up and down uh, could be uh, whether it has dissolved minerals in the water or not. Is the, is the water rich in nutrients or is it really clear and, and devoid of, of nutrients? So different properties for different types of water. Also, another factor we have to contend with in the ocean is pressure because as you as you go deeper in the ocean, they say that every 10, uh, 10 meters that you go down, if you're a diver, every 10 meters is gonna result in an increase of one atmosphere of pressure. Now, one atmosphere, that's a chemistry term, but sometimes we say that an atmosphere equals 14.6 pounds per square inch of pressure. And so if you can imagine that, that's pretty, it's a lot of pressure. Um, our ears, for example, when you go up in a plane, you're, uh, you, you might uh, have to yawn because you feel some tightening in your eardrum. What's happening is as you go up, the pressure decreases in the atmosphere. Also in the ocean though, the pressure is gonna decrease as you go up. And as you go up then, because there's less pressure on the outside, and more pressure on the inside of your body, your eardrums are actually gonna push out. So um, you might uh, hear on takeoff, you might hear, you know, or even later as you start increasing in your altitude, um, you hear some babies crying in the plane um, or some little kids and toddlers. So a good trick is to give them a piece of gum and have them chew because then I'll open up the pressure because then you can get some more uh, air going through the eustachian tubes. And so the, the, you'll equalize the pressure on either side of your eardrum. Uh, you probably have swam in a large swimming pool and tried to go down to the bottom to touch the drain or go pick up a, a diving toy or something. When you're at the bottom of the swimming pool, essentially you're at the bottom of the pool and all this water is on top of you. And that's the pressure that you feel because water wastes a lot, right? And so all that water pushing down on top of you is, uh, is what you feel in your eardrums as you're, you know, if, if you're diving deep in the water, it's pushing in instead of going out, okay? So uh, uh, as far as pressure goes, you can think of the atmosphere as a swimming pool of not water, but of air. And so at the bottom, at sea level, um, it's going to be it's going to be a, a certain pressure. But as you go up, um, you're going to be going through the the air and all. And, and the air molecules do have a little bit of weight, so they're going to be pulled down by gravity, and they're going to be found near the surface of the Earth. But as you increase, or as you as you uh, as you increase your altitude, as you go up and say a plane. You're leaving those air molecules all down there by the, on the ground there. And so uh, that's uh, gonna be a, a lower pressure. Even, even the change, like a, a, a one mile change, you can feel the difference. Because if you've ever gone from say uh, a, a coastal state, you've gone from California or Louisiana up to, I remember I had a meeting in Colorado Springs and we went to, uh, uh, and there was, 
uh, some of my some of my colleagues were from from Mississippi, and I'm from California. So when we got there, we we actually had had to acclimate a little bit, and all of us were getting headaches because there's less oxygen uh, up there, even one mile up, six thousand feet up. Uh, it's still, you know, you have a, a reduced amount of oxygen, so your body needs to get used to that. All right, so um, here is a, oh, here's a graphic showing what I was saying earlier. As you decrease, uh, um, as you decrease uh, 10, 10 meters, so it is right there, as you decrease 10 meters, uh, as you dive down, what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, you're going to see an increase in atmospheric pressure and as you go way down deep there. Look at this, nine atmospheres of pressure at 80 meters. So that's a lot. So uh, there you go. Okay, surface uh, circulation. Some of the differences seen in different parts of the ocean are due to the circulation patterns. And uh, the circulation patterns that we see on the surface of, of the ocean are generally driven by the wind. And so the wind is gonna uh, push the water along on the surface. But also what you're gonna see is that the wind is, is powered by the, uh, by the sunlight. So differences in sunlight or, or differences in heat really in the, uh, the solar energy are going to cause, uh, cause the wind patterns and so the, when the wind hits the water, that's gonna move it along. And so you can see in this picture right here, you can see some currents that are generally found in the, uh, <clears throat> in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see here is a, a west current, a western moving cur current close to Louisiana going across that way that we generally see because of the, uh, the warmer waters down here are getting pushed up over here. There's the Gulf Loop current, and then this current starts going around. And as some waters move, uh, like this one's moving east, you're gonna have some waters move and replace that water. So this is uh, going that way. Uh, to wherever there's a gap, uh, you're going to see a movement over. Uh, you're gonna see some water go in to fill Fill those, uh, fill those gaps. So some of the differences seen in different parts of the ocean are due to circulation patterns and circulation can occur in the form of waves or tides, currents, gyres. Ocean, oceanic uh, circulation is significant, significantly driven by, by the wind patterns and those wind patterns are due to the solar energy. Um, and so that's, uh, a good illustration is the Gulf of Mexico and what happens there. All right, here's a gif that shows you the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is due to this, the spinning of the earth and the winds and the currents are both affected by the Coriolis effect. You can see in this picture uh, down here, this arrow shows you that the, uh, the earth is rotating um, counterclockwise. Um, and, and as the earth as, as the earth is rotating, <coughs> if you were in a plane trying to go south from say, I don't know, what is this? Uh, Chicago down to my uh, Miami, if you were trying to do that and just fly straight, well, if you're in a plane, you have to end up you can't just fly straight it, because of the the uh, constant circulation or uh, rotation of the earth what you're going to see is uh, any any movement like that from north to south from south going north is uh, going to be a curved pattern it says here because the earth spins continuously anything that passes over the earth is deflected and uh, so in the Northern hemisphere, those winds, those currents are, are deflected to the right and it's opposite in the, in the uh, Southern hemisphere. In Australia, winds and currents are deflected to the left. And since the earth is spinning all the time, 
that causes this deflection occurrence. And you see that, uh, you see the main gyres in the, uh, in the ocean. And, um, and uh, you especially see them uh, when you take a look at the uh, surface rotation patterns of uh, the Pacific Ocean, uh, especially if you take a look at the, here's another picture showing you the Coriolis effect. And uh, this is going from North Pole down to San Diego. And if you were trying to move down that way, you'd have to fly this way because of the constant rotation of the Earth. Now, um, this also causes the trade winds and the westerlies and the easterlies. And so um, it, it's a three-dimensional thing. It's, a, it's a easier to see uh, on a, maybe a globe, but what happens is, is that at the equator, because the equator is, is slightly closer to the sun, you're gonna see that the equator gets more energy per unit area. And because it, it gets more energy, more sunlight, then you're gonna see uh, the, uh, you're gonna see the air is going to heat up and rise over the equator, but then it gets pushed to the north and south. Uh, I think that's a red arrow right here. You can see that it pushed to north and south and as it gets pushed to the north and south, it's going to uh, cool down and air actually can hold less water when it's cooler. So what you're going to see is that when, when the water, I'm sorry, when the air travels away from the equator, it's going to drop <clears throat> its water. And so that's why you get, in this area right here, you get the, the rainforest. Okay, so that's the, the rainforest right there. Uh, these are the trade winds coming across like that um, to replace the air that is moving this way. So this is moving up in the atmosphere and then moving across. And so when it gets down over here to this line, uh, it's, like it's 30 degrees north and south of the equator, what happens is that air is gonna come down and that air has already lost most of its uh, moisture. So around 30 north and south, that's where you're gonna find deserts on the earth because the, the air is coming down and it's already lost a lot of its moisture. And then it, it just goes at, and it forms a, what we call a cell. It goes up at the equator and then across, and then goes down over here at the Tropic of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn. And then it gets pushed back over towards the equator. And so it gets, it starts to heat up and as it starts to heat up, it sucks up any remaining moisture. And so that's why you, that's another reason that you get desert winds, uh, that you get desert areas around 30. So those are the trade winds. Um, as sunlight heats the air, the air rises. The cool air rushes in to take the place of the air that has risen. at those yellow arrows right there. And that is... Uh, that circulation pattern of the air going up in the atmosphere and then down in the atmosphere causes those winds. This is why winds are uh, stronger at, at the coast. Winds are, at the coast are stronger during the day compared to uh, during nighttime because those winds are driven by, by the sunlight. So what you're gonna see is uh, the sunlight during the daytime it's going to drive this process. You can see in this picture also the effect of the Coriolis effect. Those, those winds don't just go um, straight up and down, straight north and south, but because of the rotation of the earth, you're gonna see that they, they travel in this pattern. Um, because remember the earth is going this way, it's going counterclockwise, and as it goes counterclockwise, these winds here and these winds here are gonna to go to the left and these winds here and these winds here because they're going towards the poles are going to go to the right. Over here in between there are areas where they're not 
as consistently windy. We call those areas uh, the doldrums. So when people were were uh, trying to sail across the sail around the world, <clears throat> um, they would have to uh, plan it out right because then they didn't want to sit in a location that didn't have any have any winds. So that's the doldrum area right there. Uh, the winds that are consistently created in this manner at the equator are known as the trade winds. So that's these guys right here. And then these winds right here, those are the westerlies between 30 and 60. Okay. And then at the very top, I haven't mentioned yet, there is the polar easterlies that happen right there. <clears throat> and uh, it is very windy near the poles. And that is because of the, uh, the uh, rotation of the earth once again. And it's, it's spinning around. And so that wind is, is spinning around as well. Um, people sometimes think that the, the North Pole is a, a, a place where it's, it's snowy and, it, and there's a lot of wind. Well, it's right that there's a lot of wind, but as far as the snow goes, the, it, there's a lot of water at the equator. That's where you get the tropical rainforest. When, but a lot of that water drops between zero and 30 and even more drops between 30 and 60. So by the time the air makes its way up to the poles, the air, the water vapor in the atmosphere, there's hardly any of that left. And so, uh, so actually the poles are not places where there's a lot of snow. It just seems like that because the winds are kicking up. And, uh, uh, and so these are the wind patterns uh, that are, are typical in the, or on, on the world. And this is right over here. You can see those, those air cells that I was talking about. And so here you see the air coming down uh, and right here, here's the air being heated. And so because it's heated, it goes up and it moves over there and that's that where you get that circulation pattern right there. Now that <clears throat> it's not as simple as this because the land gets in the way, but uh, if you see right here, here are the continents, well then the ocean just, okay, so uh, here's the, uh, the northern equatorial current going across like that. So you get a counterclockwise movement of the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean and northern Pacific Ocean. By my house, the water is always a little cooler because uh, the water is coming down from Alaska. In Louisiana, the water is, is coming from, from further south. So uh, the water is warmer. Uh, if you've ever been to Florida on vacation, man, right over here, that water is warmer than you would expect. And it's warmer than you expect because the water is coming up from, again, the equator right there. And this movement of water then starts and you get that uh, very generalized circulation pattern. Every once in a while in the Pacific Ocean, you get something where these things get goofed up, these currents get get flipped around and that's called an El Nino event. And we'll take a look at that later in class. All righty, there are three layers of the ocean as you go down. There's the surface layer and the intermediate layer. And then there's the, the, uh, the deep water in the, in the bottom layer. Um, the numbers the now are 200 and 1,000. So the surface is uh, zero to 200. The intermediate layer is 200 to 1,000. And then the bottom layer is just below a thousand. The earth, uh, the oceans go down to uh, ooh, four and a half miles deep. So you probably know that the, the uh, deepest part of the ocean, the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean, and that's like 36,000 feet down. That's a, uh, quite a ways down. So um, this is in meters, but a meter is, is a, uh, you know, a, it's about three feet in a meter. So 36,000 feet down, that's uh, pretty deep. 
Okay, if you take a look at, at this diagram right here, this shows you how these three things change in the different layers. And in the surface layer, you have a certain expectation of, of temperature near the surface, so expect it to be warmer. And then after the deep layer and the bottom layer, the temperature of the uh, water is much lower. In the intermediate level, as far as temperature goes, you see a gradual decrease in temperature and a gradual increase in the density of water. The density is how, uh, you know, it, it's the, it, the formula for density is mass over volume. So you're gonna get more and more salt stuck in there in the deep layer water. And so because the, the deep layer water is, is uh, saltier, it's gonna stick near the bottom. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and so that's temperature and, and density. And over here, you can see the differences in salinity, which are, you know, are moving a little bit, especially at intermediate level between 200 and 1,000, but fairly consistent at 35 parts per thousand um, as you go into that deep layer right there. So it can be higher and lower as we talked about earlier, but once you get to the deep layer, it's pretty consistent right there. So that water sometimes uh, as it goes down, as it hits a continent, uh, that downward turning is called a downwelling of water and that water sinks and it goes under. Um, and that's because of, of temperature and salinity and it has hit a land mass. Um, so downwelling is good though, brings gases from the surface down to those deeper layers. So those deeper layers have, uh, you know, uh, have oxygen in them because of the uh, downwelling in certain areas. Um, you probably more likely have heard of an upwelling. An upwelling happens, uh, Oh, uh, the coast of Peru, there's really good fishing. And the reason there's really good fishing right here is because of the upwelling of water and the currents move uh, the, the deep water up um, when it hits South America. And so the area um, to the west of Peru and Ecuador and Chile, all these are really good for fishing because the, new, the water is nutrient rich and the fish are able to reproduce, get what they need so that they can uh, have a higher reproductive rate. So that's why you see a lot of uh, good fishing grounds there because of the upwelling as the, as the uh, nutrients move up. Then as far as waves go, waves are the result of winds blowing over the water surface, as you can see right here. This area right here is called the fetch. That's the area affected by, by the wind. And, and so when you have a, uh, a, a larger fetch, you're going to have uh, some bigger waves. And so this is the, where, where the wind is uh, hitting the water. And so if it's blowing this way and it's blowing right in this area, this fetch right here, you're going to see big waves over here. So the waves are a result of the wind blowing over the water, uh, water surface and uh, things that determine the size of waves uh, include uh, how long and fast the wind blows, but also it's gonna be affected by, by the bottom of the ocean because those waves aren't going to uh, uh, curl over um, until they get to uh, touch essentially the bottom of the ocean. And before we go into that, here are the parts of the wave. Uh, they're the same as a sound wave. So this is part of my physics talk. But if you have a wave, the wavelength is the area between a trough and a trough or a crest and a crest. The height of a wave is called the amplitude right there. And uh, so these are important things uh, to know about waves. And if you were to sit right here and watch the waves go by and count the waves, then um, uh, the, the time between two crests, let's say, that would be what we call the period of a wave, or as I wrote here, the wave period. Um, there's a trough, there's a crest, um, 
amplitude, wavelength. These are terms you should know. have to do in parts of the wave. Now it's saying that the, uh, the wave uh, curls over and you can see that right here, we say that the wave is breaking there. And this wave doesn't break until it hits the shallow water. And when it gets to shallow water, then we're going to have the uh, breaking of the wave and where that happens continuously, that's called the surf. Uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, the surf can actually move the beach uh, on a, when it's a, like I'd say that spring in California, uh, the, the beach sand will actually move up. And during the winter where there's really uh, strong storms and uh, that'll, the surf will actually take off some of the sand and some of the beaches will, will go away. So uh, it says here as waves near the shore, uh, the bottom of the wave drags the bottom and it's, that's when it starts to break because then it starts to, all these waves here get piled up and start to slow down. And so the wavelength changes and it gets shorter. And so the, um, when, when the top of that wave right there falls over, that's when we say it breaks. <clears throat> okay, so here's another picture showing you a series of waves there. There's a ocean bird sitting there on the top, just riding the waves right there. Uh, the last topic that pertains to this is the tides. And so the tides, you have a, the tides are defined as the rhythmic rising and falling of sea surface levels. And we can see in this diagram right here, what it is, is the tide is, is due primarily, and, and people get this wrong, but it's primarily due to the pull of the moon. As the, the moon is much closer <clears throat> to the earth, than the sun. So when the moon is close, that's when you get a high tide. But if you pull this side over and the water is pulling up, then on the other side of the earth, there's going to be a matching high tide. And then the edges, they're going to have low tide because all the water is piling up here and here. So that's why you have high tides and low tides. Um, uh, and, and the sun is much, much more massive, but it's 93 million miles away. So, um, so it, had, uh, it had the lesser effect on the ocean waves. Now, um, you're going to have, during the course of the day, you're going to have a couple of high tides, typically, and a couple of low tides. Um, that would be, you know, if, if we didn't have any land, then that's what, what it would be. But because of of the land uh, that affects the tides. And, and so um, some places will have, have only one tide, high tide and one low tide, or a different combination of these different things. So um, most places uh, have, have a semi-urinal or a semi-diurnal uh, tide pattern where you have two highs and two lows during a 24-hour period. Um, you have, uh, uh, well, let's see, so normally tides at night are higher and lower than daytime high, uh, daytime tides. Um, and then the number and size of tides varies geographically and can be affected by bottom features and all kinds of different places. There's a, a place in Canada called the Bay of Fundy, which is known for its, uh, very big tides and that because it's in a bay and, uh, and so during the course of the day you have a, a really big change in the, the heights of the, the low and the high tide. And so we would say that that area has a very high or very large tidal range. You can see here's another diagram that shows you uh, the high tides and and so there's the moon right there pulling the ocean up. And so because it's pulling up here, it's, uh, 
the rest of the ocean is <coughs> getting bigger there, but not as tall on the edges right here. Okay. And uh, this shows you what would happen if you're looking at it from a, a bird's eye view. And you could see that, okay, if the high tides at midnight, at six in the morning, this same place where the flag is, is now over here. <coughs> so you're going to see the low tide. And then at noontime, it's going to pass through the high tide because it's, here's the earth rotating if you're looking at it from above. And so here's the flag over here in the high tide and about six o'clock in the evening, <coughs> you're gonna have the, uh, have it go through, your, your location is gonna go through the low tide and then back over here, you're gonna have the high tide again. It says here not quite the high tide, that's because the lunar <coughs> uh, time is not, uh, hour, 24 hour day, but it's uh, 24 hours and 50 minutes. So that's why the tide is going to be, if it's midnight on this day, uh, it's at the high tide, it's going to be a different time, 1250, see that? Um, and, and so that's why the, the t uh, times of the tides are going to change. Here's another diagram that shows us the same thing. But then um, but this is the difference between the spring and the neap tide. The spring tide is when the moon and the sun are pulling together. And the neap tide happens when the sun and the moon are pulling at 90 degree angles from each other. So here's another spring tide. This is uh, during, the, uh, during the new moon and this is during the full moon. So when you see the full moon, this is when you're high tide or when you have a situation where you you only see a very small sliver of the moon, that's gonna be a, a spring tide as well. The neap tides happen in between, two weeks in between. And that's, a, that's because the moon and the sun are pulling at different angles from, from each other. So those are the tides. And, uh, and some animals, some organisms like these grunion here, during the summer months in Southern California, actually use the tide patterns <clears throat> as, a, as times to reproduce. What they want to do is time it so that they can go further up on the coast and then they will, up on the beach that is, and then they will lay their eggs uh, up high here on the beach. And then, uh, and then you, the, as the tides go out over the course of the month, uh, these, uh, these eggs are are sitting out of the water, um, still moist, but, but not deep in the ocean or anything. And then when the next uh, time period comes, then it'll come and wash away those, uh, <clears throat> those uh, that smelt, that eggs, and those fertilized eggs will go back into the ocean. That's how grunion reproduce. Um, when they come up like this, this is called a, a grunion run. If you have a, a a California fishing license, you can go out and grab some of these guys and throw it in your bucket. So it's a, a common occurrence during, during the summer months in Southern California. But grunion aren't the only ones. There are other animals um, that uh, time their reproduction according to the tides. And so that's significant. All right, so chemistry of seawater and some other uh, topics that have to do with that uh, today. I hope you saw something that was insightful for you today. And uh, I will see you next time. All righty. All right.